and he uh, will divide the spoil with the strong because he had poured out his soul into death. If you love your life, you'll lose it. But if you lose your life, you'll you'll gain it. If you if you gain the whole world but lose your own soul, what's it going to profit you in this time when he's handing out the spoil, when he's giving out those lands, he's giving out those cities, he's giving out that inheritance to the children of God who were strong. We're in the book of Joshua today, Joshua chapter number 14. And uh, it's been about five years, over five years, I've been teaching the book of Joshua. And uh, it's pretty exciting that my pastor is going to be teaching through the book of Joshua now in our church, our local church. And I'm really looking forward to that because uh, if any man thinks he knows anything, he doesn't know it as he ought. And there's always different angles that people approach it at and um, people will see things that you don't see. So I'm kind of interested. I can't wait. Uh, actually, tomorrow on Wednesday night, he'll be going through the book of Joshua. And uh, he said that he was going to kind of, uh, I think, fly over more chapter 13 through 21. And I guess I don't blame him on that. That's where I've been spinning my wheels here for quite a while, trying to preach this, trying to understand this and uh, make application. I understand what it meant for Israel, but what does it mean for the church? You know, that all these things were written for our examples. The things that the children of Israel went through in this Old Testament, they were a body of believers. They were a body a nation, but now we have local bodies, local assemblies, uh, gatherings of people that are to learn from the example that was set forth in the Old Testament. So don't throw away your Old Testament. It's very important. And we'll dive right into it. And these are the countries which the children of Israel inherited in the land of Canaan, which Eleazar the priest and Joshua the son of Nun and the heads of the fathers of the tribes of the children of Israel distributed for inheritance to them. By lot was their inheritance, as the Lord commanded by the hand of Moses, for the nine tribes and for the half-tribe. For Moses had given the inheritance of two tribes and a half-tribe on the other side of Jordan, but unto the Levites he gave none inheritance among them. For the children of Joseph were two tribes, Manasseh and Ephraim. Therefore they gave no part unto the Levites in the land, save cities to dwell in, with their suburbs, for their cattle, and for their substance. As the Lord commanded Moses, so the children of Israel did, and they divided the land. Father, Lord, please bless your word, God. I've been on this for a very, very long time, looking at this, reading this. Um, to say I'm prepared is still uh, not the whole truth, Lord. I, <laughs> this, there's a lot here, Lord, that could be said. Um, there's a lot in your word, and there's uh, I could never, I could never mine all the depths of this. But I pray, Lord, that you would help me to bring to surface what you'd have me to bring. And I can't do it unless you show me, unless you teach me. Even as I go, i uh, been sitting there learning from you, Lord, for probably, I don't know, six months on this. And I'm still not even really as prepared as I ought to be to teach it. But please give me the grace to do it. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. I wish I kind of had like a little platform thing right here kind of like Brother Knox has, so I can just kind of look down. I feel like I'm really putting my head down to read these scriptures. And then you get to look at the top of my uh, balding head. Oh, it's starting to, starting to go bald here. <laughs> uh, depends on how much hair gel or product I put in. Yeah, now I'm starting to get to that age where I want to start putting those thickening shampoos in and all that stuff. <laughs> You laugh, but wait till you're 40 years old. And that's when the hair starts coming off your head and it starts growing on your ears. And I get like quite a bit on the tops of my ears even. And it sounds like Velcro. I mean, I, I'll shave it, you know, and it just kind of pops back up. I mean, sometimes I've used a razor and I've even kind of accidentally cut in the top of my ear. Oh, you got a lot to look forward to, young people. <laughs> and these are the countries with the children of Israel inherit in the land of Canaan. You know, God promised the children of Israel a land. That land of Canaan is not just modern day uh, Jerusalem, Israel, that that small little area that they uh, that that they occupy. But it's a much vaster, vast, much more vast uh, sized land. And from what I've heard, it's actually pyramid shaped. 
And um, I'm not going to give you all the dimensions of it because I don't know them off the top of my head. I'm not that smart. I'm not that much of a geographer. And these are the countries which the children of Israel inherited in the land of Canaan. This is that promised land. This is the land that God would not have the children of Israel, Israel occupy until their enemy's cup was running over their cup of sin. God gives mercy. God is long suffering as he was long suffering in the days of Noah. And he waited for quite a long time for 120 years as Noah preached righteousness. And then judgment came, but not before they were afforded plenty of opportunities to repent. Same as the uh, state of these Canaanites. They've had 400 years, over 400 years, 430 years. Maybe that's just the grace of God. I believe it was supposed to be 400 until Israel would come into the land of Canaan. Uh, Maybe even longer than that, but God is merciful. That's the bottom line. And these people, they had space to repent, just as he gives every man space to repent. And he also gives you the measure of faith. And uh, Israel is expected to obey God. Israel is expected to occupy this land. This land would not be occupied and would be delayed for another 40 years. So 430 plus, I believe, another 40. So 470 years before they finally go in there under Joshua. And because of unbelief, they were judged of God in order for them just to circle the land and and camp and then pick up and move and just keep going in circles. And there was a group of people that tried to go into Canaan and tried to fight a battle and they lost. Why? Because God said, I'm not going with you. You had your chance in a certain day. God speaks of in Hebrews, they were afforded the opportunity to believe and go into that land. And then once that generation, the majority of them, their hearts melted from the negative report of 10 spies and the two spies, Joshua and Caleb, they didn't mind their report. God says, this is my decision. You're going to wander here until you die. And then the next generation, those under 20 years old and over will enter into that land. And it's interesting that God didn't hold the 20 year old and younger uh, accountable for unbelief. And, um, I, I do believe that, that that hints towards the age of accountability. Is it 20 years old? It could be. Um, more than likely, it's the age that a person understands that they're a sinner and they can rebel against God. But then there's a lot of, uh, of talk about these people not understanding sin, not understanding fully what was the report that was given to them. And I'm not going to turn to all those verses, and I may have done it in previous studies, but it's, it's an interesting thing that God, I wouldn't be surprised if he waits to a person, he, what he considers an adult, you know, uh, that they can go into war, go into battle. I know in America, 18 years old is considered an adult, but then yet they're, they're legal to go fight in a war, but they're not legal to drink till 21. So, uh, you know, we all have our different standards and it looks like God's standards 20 years old. Um, let's see here. You know, it's kind of interesting that I came to the Lord at 20 years old. You know, I've professed faith in Jesus Christ when I was a young boy, probably seven or so was baptized and everything, but it wasn't real to me. It didn't enter into my heart truly until I was 20. And that goes along with that. Not just because, Hey, my testimony fits that, but it does look that way, uh, quite a bit biblically speaking, but I've said it before and I'll say it again. If you're 13 years old and God's convicting you of your sin and you know that your sin put him on the cross and you know right from wrong and the preacher preaches the gospel, you better respond to that. Don't worry about what age you are. Just come to the Lord when you understand it. And these are the countries which the children of Israel inherited in the land of Canaan, which Eleazar the priests and Joshua the son of Nun and the heads of the fathers of the tribes of the children of Israel distributed for inheritance to them. So what does that mean for Israel? Israel gets that land because they go into battle and even the tribes that wanted to stay back, they agreed that they would go forth in battle. This is Reuben, Gad, and the half tribe of Manasseh and help the rest of the tribes 
to obtain the land. And we see Joshua and also Eliezer, the priests, dividing up this land. And Joshua is a type of Jesus Christ. He is a conqueror. He is a king. And he will one day as king of kings and lord of lords, he will rule and reign. And he will also give out an inheritance. And he is also our high priest. And he will pass out our inheritance. He will fulfill both of those roles as Joshua and Eleazar do here. There's not a need of two men doing this passing out of inheritance. One man does it, the king priest, Jesus Christ. When we uh, stand before him at the judgment seat of Christ, he will give us rewards. And I also do believe after we come down with him and conquer the foes, that when he sets up his kingdom, he will say, if you are faithful in this much, inherit the kingdom that is before you, inherit this city, inherit this land, inherit this and occupy this. And uh, we, it's amazing because, you know, we always, you know, when my pastor was dealing with it, he was saying that in the songs, we always say that crossing over Jordan pictures going to heaven. And I don't believe that's really the main meaning of that. And uh, I'm sure my pastor agrees, but that that is going into the spirit filled life as far as what it means to the church. It's the life of victory, but there's going to be battles. There's going to be spiritual warfare there, but this is what God promised us. And this is what God has blessed us with all these spiritual blessings. And it's not physical as Israel. It is, is a spiritual thing for us to go and, and occupy places in our heart, in our mind that the devil once occupied. And we have right to that. But as much as it means that to the church, I do believe in a prophetic sense that the word of God is quick and powerful and it's sharper than any two edged sword. You know, it means something to Israel. And I learned this from brother uh, George Antonios, I call him San Antonios. But that, what it means to Israel is the handle of that sword. You can handle that. You can, you can get a grip on that. That's in history. That's, this is written to those people, those children of Israel, and they literally get this land. But then in a spiritual sense, it has application to the church. And we have many spiritual blessings that can be had because they're promised to us of God, but we have to fight for them. We have to fight the world, the flesh, and the devil to obtain these but then yet it doesn't stop there. There's another edge to that sword and that's a prophetic edge. And I do believe that it pictures after we cross over Jordan or cross over into heaven because Jesus Christ comes back on a white horse. Does he not? He comes back and he fights the war of Armageddon and we come back with him and he leads us in the battle. And if you read the book of Joel chapter number two, you'll see that we, uh, are able to devour our adversaries in a way that may be fire breathing, similar to the two prophets that do that. And then before us is the Garden of Eden, it looks like, you know, and then behind us is a desolate place. It's all burned up. So Joshua leads the physical, earthly kingdom of God into battle to conquer a foe. And I believe that is picturing what's going to come. What's going to come is Jesus Christ. Joshua is a type of Jesus Christ. He's going to lead us who the saints. It's an army that was never like any army before. Look at Joel chapter number two, that we won't break our ranks. And if we fall on the sword, we won't die. And, and we're going to obtain land. We're going to take the land from the enemy, just as Joshua did here. And after that, he judges the nations. And after that, some nations are able to, to stay. And after that, I believe he hands out what we read of. And uh, let's, let's turn it real quick. As they thought that the kingdom of God should immediately appear, he said, therefore, a certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. And he called his 10 servants, and delivered unto them 10 pounds and said unto them, occupy till I come. That's our job. But his citizens hated him. And sent a messenger after him saying, we will not have this man to reign over us. Sounds familiar. Sounds like Israel, doesn't it? And it came to pass that when he was, ret then he returned, having received the kingdom and he receives that of his father. Why? Because he suffered and he, 
and he died and he rose again from the dead and he's the only begotten of the father the only one that has pro- been promised to to have this high seat this who's been lifted up by god and then he's able to give it to who whom he may whoever he will then he commanded these servants to be called unto him to whom he had given the money that he might know how much every man gained by trading then came the first saying lord thy pound have gained 10 pounds and he said unto him well thou good servant because thou hast been faithful in very little have thou authority over 10 cities just like joshua has given out cities he's given out lands to the people of god in the old testament here jesus christ is given authority and he's given cities to those that were faithful in this life and the second came saying lord thy pound have gained five pounds and he said likewise to him be thou also over five cities and another came saying lord behold here is thy pound which i have kept laid up in a napkin for i feared thee because thou art an austere man thou takest up that thou layest not down and reapest that thou didst not sow and he saith unto him out of thine own mouth will i judge thee thou wicked servant thou knewest that i was an austere man taken up that i laid not down and reaping that i did not sow wherefore then gavest not thou my money in the bank that at my coming i might have required mine own with usury and he said unto them that stood by take from him the pound and give it to him that have ten pounds and they said unto him lord he have ten pounds and uh, i'm not going to keep going but he is going to reward his faithful servants and if you had been given little in this life and you were faithful in that little he will give you double or 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 like like job had a certain amount and he got double didn't he after it was lost he he recovered all that god gave it back to him in our life we don't get it back at the end of our life or or late in our life but we get it after our life is over and when he returns to this earth he and, and it's based off of your faithfulness what you did with what talents or what abilities god gave you he doesn't expect you to do above what he's given you to do we all are to serve God after our own several abilities or different abilities that God gives us. And then when we do, it glorifies God. And then God will, will reward those that do that with what? With land, with cities. It's coming up. I mean, it's a lot more than, oh, I'm saved and that's all that matters. And I'm going to have, you know, even if it's just a little cabin up there in heaven. The truth is we're not going to be up there in heaven for very long. We're going to come back to this earth. We're going to rule and reign with Christ on the earth. And we're not in heaven for a thousand years, it looks like. I'm not to say that we can't go back and forth, but largely we're going to be here. We're going to have a job to do on this earth. After that thousand years is up, Jesus Christ gives that throne in Jerusalem to David to rule over forever. And then he sits down in the new Jerusalem as the new Jerusalem comes down at the end of the millennial reign. And then we occupy that new Jerusalem, but it's on the earth. And uh, we see here on the earth, a kingdom being divided amongst those that are faithful against uh, or, uh, against the foe that, that are, are the tribes of Israel. But we see a portion on the other side that was given to Reuben, Gad, and half tribe of Manasseh. And some people, they're content with what they can get in this life. They're content with the blessings they can get in this life, and, and they want the glory now. If you want the glory now, you will get your reward, but it's in this life. If you want all the recognition now, you'll get it, but this is it's this life. You want to concentrate as a saved person just on how much money you can make and how successful you can be and how you can impress your worldly friends, or even some of your Christian friends, you will get your reward in this life. But what shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? You were created for something much greater. I'm just looking back here. It looks like my uh, blue coloring is not as, as blue as I thought it was going to be. I uh, put a little blue coloring on the wall there. Not this is it's from a lamp. I didn't color my wall like a child. That's my little attempt of humor there. So God, well, I don't even remember what I was talking about. God is going to reward us. Jesus Christ is going to reward us. But some of us at the judgment seat of Christ are going to stand there ashamed. Why? Because we gain the world. 
we gained everything we wanted, but we weren't willing to die to self. We weren't willing to take up our cross. We weren't willing to bear his reproach to, uh, to be in the fellowship of his sufferings or to suffer persecution for our faith. We wanted to blend in. And, uh, usually it's because you're short sighted and all you can see is the temporal. And that's the way Reuben, Gad and half tribe of Manasseh were. And then they got their reward. They did get it, but it was on the other side and they were susceptible, susceptible to attack and they got attacked first. They were taken into captivity first by Assyria. And then, uh, the rest of the children of Israel end up getting taken into captivity also. Um, but, you leave yourself open to attack by the enemy because you've separated yourself from the, the, the largeness of that group of believers. When you separate yourself from church, that's what the devil will do. He will, he will get the weak separated from the flock. And that's the way lions attack. And then they get the weak one, usually oftentimes a single uh, lamb or a single animal. And, when it, and, and once it's weak and it's by itself, they attack it and kill it. And, um, but so many people have lost their spiritual life. They lost their, their, their soul, so to speak. They sold their soul. <laughs> Some people sell their soul, you know, that, but they've never even been the keeper of that soul. It's God who's the keeper of our soul. Some people they're saved, but they sell out as to why God made them. God made them for his pleasure, but they live for their pleasure. And God says, you will get rewarded for that in this life. Hold on, I got a call. Okay, definitely want to cut all that out. Okay, so by lot was their inheritance as the Lord commanded by the hand of Moses for the nine tribes and for the half tribe. And remember, that's not including Reuben Gad or half tribe of Manasseh because they wanted their cake and eat it too. And they wanted their best life now. And they were really into Joel Osteen, you know, so they're, uh, <laughs> they're going to get their, their, theirs on this side of life. If that's what you want, you know, you want all the stardom now, you want all the praise of men now, then go for it, but don't expect it later. <laughs> you want to suffer now, you, you want to, you know, had the fellowship of his sufferings, and God said, I'll, you'll reign with me. For Moses had given the inheritance of two tribes and a half tribe on the other side of Jordan, but unto the Levites he gave none inheritance among them. You want to receive your inheritance from, you know, being a good guy or a good person and just trying to, you know, do things according to the law and trying to keep the law and being like a good little Catholic or like a good Baptist or whatever you know, then you got your reward, but it's, it's under, not under Jesus Christ. He's not rewarding you for that, but it's under, uh, the authority here and, and this, in this life, you know, so I'm sorry, just a little bit off in my mind here after, uh, talking with the doctors, um, setting up appointments and stuff, but, you know, just keep me in your prayers. I have a few different things that'll be getting taken care of here soon, but the main one, I have a lump on my left, um, like love handle or side. I don't like to refer to it as a love handle, but I guess I got love handles a little bit. <laughs> uh, I think most of us do after we're 40, but there's a little lump there that I found when I lost some weight, you know, and it got a little more prominent. And, uh, so I got to get that taken care of because it's starting to hurt my side and hurt my back and, and it's just uncomfortable for the most part, most of the time, except for when I'm standing or laying down, but praise the Lord. It doesn't seem to bother me much when I'm preaching surprisingly. Um, but you know, it's likely a fatty tumor or some lipoma. I believe they, that's how they pronounce it. And usually those are not cancerous, but this one has pain associated. So it could be cancerous or it could just be uh, blood vessels in the area. It could be nerves in the area that is pressing on. So just keep me in your prayers concerning that. For Moses had given the inheritance of two tribes and a half tribe on the other side of Jordan, but under the Levites, he gave none inheritance among them. For the children of Joseph were two tribes, Manasseh and Ephraim. 
Therefore, they gave no part unto the Levites in the land, safe cities to dwell in. And you got to understand that when God sets up his kingdom, the head of the nations is going to be Israel. And then he also includes us in this kingdom because we got in because Israel rejected their Messiah. And uh, that's pictured by Joseph and, and, and the older brothers of Joseph sending Joseph off into slavery. And uh, they put that blood on his garment and everything. And well, you know, Jesus Christ actually shed his blood and everything. And he comes back. And he sets up a kingdom as Joseph returned on the scene. And all of a sudden, he is the savior of everybody that would come to Egypt. And when the, the famine hits, all of these brothers go back into Egypt. And then they don't recognize him at first, but then they end up recognizing him. And they think that he's just going to get vengeance on them. And, you know, and they're, they're afraid. And then they think after, well, surely after... The, their father dies uh, that he he's now going to do it, but he doesn't, he shows them mercy and, um, and, and they dwell there and uh, you know what, but God is going to show mercy to Israel. God is going to establish Israel and he's going to set up his kingdom and they're going to be at the head of the nations. But we get in because of the rejection of Jesus Christ. We are like uh, Joseph is like Jesus Christ and we are like, Ephraim and Manasseh and it's comprised the church is both comprised of Jew and Gentile and Manasseh was the firstborn that should have got the blessing and but Ephraim when when the blessing was given out uh Jacob he he, he switched his hands didn't he and it and it's funny because you know that's not the way it's supposed to go and Joseph was kind of upset, but he goes, I did this knowingly. I know what I'm doing. And it's supposed to go to the to the Jew first and then to the Greek. And I'm not going to try to get it too deep into this, but uh, we're like Ephraim and we, we get a large blessing and getting in the body of Christ. And there's a very small amount of really saved Jews compared to the amount of Gentiles that get in. And... Uh, <laughs> We're, it's not so much the first, but it's more of the second. And it's never the first birth that's pleasing to God, but it's the second, the second birth. It's not so much Manasseh, but Ephraim. It's not uh, Ishmael, but Isaac. And um, it's not Esau, but um, Jacob. Sorry, just having a hard time here. For the children of Joseph were two tribes, Manasseh and Ephraim. Therefore, they gave uh, no part unto the Levites in the land, save cities to dwell in. And remember where I spoke of the Levites, that that they inherit the service of the Lord and, and the Lord himself. And in this life, oftentimes it looks like we're kind of robbed of any blessing um, because it's not physical as it was for Israel, but it's spiritual. And we see the world and we see everybody else have so many nice things and everything seems to work out so well for them and, and prosperity. But oftentimes the children of God are poor. They don't have very much. They struggle just to get by. But what they do have that the world doesn't have is the Lord. And we have our service towards our Lord. And that is our inheritance while we're on this earth. We inherit him. We inherit that relationship. We inherit the service of the Lord. And that's pictured here by the Levites in the land. And they, they're given uh, no land in particular, save cities to dwell in with their suburbs for their cattle and for their substance. And we are like them. We don't have a, a, a permanent dwelling here. We're like pilgrims, but we're just kind of borrowing this place for a little while, you know, and we're not meant to put our roots down and, and get in love with this world or, you know, get in love with your property, get in love with your land and get in love with s staying here. Yes, we're going to come back and we're going to rule and reign, but you're not going to dwell uh, in the same house or you wouldn't even want to. You know, when we come back and we're going to have mansions, we're going to have uh, probably s a substantially better place. <laughs> To say the least, when we come back and we rule and reign with Christ, it's like our vacation home. And then we have our home in the New Jerusalem. 
even yet to come, and that's going to be pretty amazing. There's so much blessing in this book, so amazing book. Uh, and it's on a surface, you look at this, and I've read this I don't know how many times, but it's hard to grasp it all. It's hard to understand how do I preach this? What, what does this mean for us? It means that we're blessed in this life. It means that if all we want to do is receive the recognition in this life that we will get it in this life, but we will lose it in the life to come. It means that if we suffer with him and we're, if we're faithful, that he rewards the faithful, that when we come into the kingdom, that we will be rewarded, that we are, we're only blessed because Joseph was rejected or Jesus was rejected. And then therefore we were able to get in and uh, the hands were kind of switched and it was more Gentile rather than the one God started off with, which is the Jew, though he sought after the Jews first. And uh, it's not the first birth, but the second birth that pleases God. Well, uh, I'm going to please God in my flesh. I'm going to keep the commandments. I'm going to do this and that. Well, you're going to go away sorrowfully because you can't keep them. But that's why you need a second birth, because that second birth is by faith, grace through faith. And without faith, it is impossible to please him. You try to please him with your religion, you're going to end up in hell. It will never please him. You try to please him with your self-righteousness, you will fall short of the glory of God and you will fall short of heaven and you will not have any place in his kingdom. But if you humble yourself, you will be exalted in due time. And when he returns is that time, you will not be exalted more than likely in this life. You may get some of that, but just be very careful that it doesn't go to your head or that, that that's all you're in pursuit of because you don't want to miss out on what is coming next and the next life. This is all a test. This is all trials. This is a uh, this is a practice run, and everything we do in this life is little, but everything that will come from us being faithful in the little is the big things. Even pastor in a church is a little thing. I think all of it's little, but we got to be faithful in the little, and then he'll be a rewarder in much or in the life to come. As the Lord commanded Moses, so the children of Israel did. And they divided the land. So remember what I said, that when you cross over Jordan and you go into the Canaan land, there's going to be enemies. There's going to be foes. And some people say, well, that can't picture heaven because when we go to heaven, there is no foes in heaven. There's no, well, <laughs> how about to say there's no war in heaven, but the Bible says there was war in heaven, didn't it? You know that there's war that goes on in that spiritual realm. You know that the devil even has access to heaven. But there's no war in heaven, they say. Well, that kingdom of heaven will be on this earth. And as that kingdom of heaven before it is established, it is established in war. And that war is led by Jesus Christ, which is typified here by Joshua. So when does that happen? After we cross over the Jordan, after we're dead, or after the dead in Christ rise first and, and, and we which are alive and remain are caught up to, together to meet him in the air. And then he gives us a judgment seat of Christ where we receive reward. And then we come back on white horses. We conquer the foe. And then Joshua, Jesus, sets up his kingdom. And then he gives out lands and inheritances and, and blessing. And it's not in this life that we're promised a paycheck. From God, but we are promised that if we're faithful and if we suffer with Him in the life to come, He will be a rewarder of those. This has been approved unto God, and uh, I hope you got something out of this. It's not as smooth <laughs> as I would have liked it to have been, and I uh, kind of wish I didn't get that phone call and get my mind distracted and off the topic at hand. Let's look at 1 Kings chapter 9 and verse 10. This is something I learned from Brother Stu, who goes down uh, the church at um, Brother Doss's church down in South Carolina. 1 Kings chapter 9 and verse 10. Now, Hiram, he, he was friends with, with David, and he was a, a benefit to David. And then he's a benefit to Solomon and he gives Solomon trees from Lebanon. And those trees are, are 
meant for that building of that of that not tabernacle but the the temple of God and he ships down these trees and uh, there's a very good message by Stuart Drotty that was called Hiram's Disappointment and he talks about how those trees are like a type of people and sometimes people are likened to trees and you, we see that we're like a tree planted by the rivers of waters and uh, he, he fills up that kingdom and brings in trees. And then during this time, it's, it's likening to us during this time in the church age where we're, we're supposed to be bringing trees into the kingdom. We're supposed to be preaching the gospel and get, getting people saved. We don't get them saved, but we do what we're supposed to do and getting the gospel out. And God's the one that saves them. He that soweth is nothing. And he that watereth is nothing. There's not great soul winners out there. But we are like Hiram, and we're going to be rewarded for that. And Solomon is the one that's like Christ, and he ends up rewarding Hiram for his faithful service to his kingdom. And it came to pass at the end of 20 years when Solomon had built the two houses, the house of the Lord and the king's house. Now Hiram, the king of Tyre, had furnished Solomon with cedar trees and fir trees and with gold according to all his desire. Then King Solomon gave Hiram 20 cities in the land of Galilee. And remember that parable talking about giving cities out. And uh, when Jesus Christ comes back, that's what he's going to do. Just as Solomon does for Hiram. And Hiram came out from Tyre to see the cities which Solomon had given him, and they pleased him not. And he said, what cities are these which thou hast given me, my brother? And he called them the land of Kabul unto this day, which I, th I believe that meant like like worthless or it's like refuse it's no good and Hiram sent to the king six score talents of gold and this is the reason of the levy which king solomon raised for to build the house of the lord and his own house in milo and the wall of jerusalem and hazor and megiddo and gizer and uh, i think i'm gonna stop there but but we see that what he was rewarded with is lands and the lands were not what he was was expecting they weren't they weren't the type of lands that he would like he was a uh, uh lived in a port town or a port city and and then these were in the mountainous region this is where uh like modern day galilee would be and and it's still in jesus time was not a very nice place to live you know and it was still not a great land and can anything good come out of galilee or out of nazareth and uh you know what I don't want to preach all his message, but you should check out Brother Stu's message. He talks about when we get our rewards and we were rewarded with more responsibility and we're given these cities that just went through the tribulation and there's going to be a burying of dead bodies for, I forget how long, seven months or longer. And uh, we're going to be getting these desolate cities and we're going to be like, oh, wow, that, <laughs> that's not what I expected. You know, I mean, they seem disappointed, you know, and. So, you know, sometimes God gets us out of our comfort zones and, but he is going to, he's going to reestablish his kingdom and we are going to be satisfied. I'm not saying that we're not going to be satisfied, but that pictures that reward that's coming. And, uh, like I said, check out brother Stu's message and I definitely couldn't do it justice and off the top of my head, but it, it was a blessing. I really enjoyed that message that he preached as something where he talks about how just like Dunkirk was a failed mission and uh, needed rescued. These people needed rescued that were pinned in a corner that the rapture would be uh, basically because we failed as the church and that we needed evacuation from the enemy. And uh, now I think I'm really done. This has, been approved. this has been approved unto God. And I hope you join me again next time. Amen. God bless you. While I was editing, I thought, here's another good little nugget, uh, another little bit of bonus footage for you. Isaiah chapter number 53 is just something I thought of while I was editing here. And I was like, well, I want to include this. I wish I would have said this. I didn't think of it. And this is the verse I want you to see. Therefore, will I divide him a portion with the great? And he's been given a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord of the glory of God the Father, that he is the only begotten of the Father because he is the only one promised this. 
this great lifting up and, and being above everybody else. He is the only begotten. He's the, the son of promise. He is like, not like Esau, but he is like Jacob. He is not like Ishmael, but he is like Isaac. He's the, the, the promised one. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great and he shall divide the spoil. He's going to divide it. What did Joshua do? Did he take all that land and for, for himself, though he could have? No, he divided that land. He gave it to who? He will divide the spoil with the strong. Did he divide the spoil with those that died on the other side of Jordan in unbelief? No, those were only occupied with the temporal. Those that had the spiritual minds to conquer and to go forward with Joshua, those are the ones that got the land of Canaan. Those that are going to live in the spiritual life and, and, and suffer affliction with God and going to fight the spiritual warfare that goes along with Canaan victory, a victorious Christian life. Those are those that are strong, strong in faith. Without faith, it is impossible to please him. We have to believe the report of God concerning the promises that he has gifted us, he's given us, and we need to occupy till he comes. We need to occupy all the territory that Satan has taken from God and from us and get that land back. And it says that if we are like that, he says he'll divide the spoil with the strong, not the weak, but the strong, because he had poured out his soul unto death. That's what we got to do. It, only when I'm weak am I strong. I have to die and then God will make me strong. I will die to myself and God will strengthen me. And he uh, will divide the spoil with the strong because he had poured out his soul unto death. If you love your life, you'll lose it. But if you lose your life, you'll you'll gain it. If you if you gain the whole world but lose your own soul, what's it going to profit you in this time when he's handing out the spoil, when he's giving out those lands, he's giving out those cities, he's giving out that inheritance to the children of God who were strong. And he uh, will divide the spoil with the strong because he had poured out his soul into death. If you love your life, you'll lose it. But if you lose your life, you'll you'll gain it. If you, if you gain the whole world but lose your own soul, what's it going to profit you in this time when he's handing out the spoil, when he's giving out those lands, he's giving out those cities, he's giving out that inheritance to the children of God who were strong? And it says, and he was numbered with the transgressors. So Jesus Christ here, this often is overlooked about how he poured out his soul to death and he is given out and dividing the spoil with the strong. Just thought that that would bless you. That's what we're talking about in Joshua. That's what we're talking about prophetically with Jesus Christ when he comes back and sets up his kingdom. God bless you. I hope that was a blessing to you for a little nugget there. Amen.